The Weather Hills For days, the heroes pursued the remnants of the war party east from Chetwood across the northern edge of Midgewater Marshes and into the wide plains beyond. Along the way, they came upon several burnt homesteads. Each was plainly the work of orcish savagery. However, at each home, the heroes were surprised to find no bodies. Instead, they found signs of struggle and the unmistakable tracks of orcs dragging their captives away. Why would retreating orcs stop to take prisoners? asked one of the heroes, examining the impressions on the ground. Perhaps they think to ransom their lives, answered another as he emerged from the charred ruins of a collapsed hovel. One or two prisoners would have sufficed if that was their intent, but these orcs had taken dozens at least, replied the first. Look at the markings here. The man in the doorway knelt by his companion to examine the earth more closely. After a minute, he said, I think I see the answer to this riddle. The orcs we chase are not the same that attacked this home, though it is likely that they are in league with each other. Look here! The prints made by this family as they struggled against their captors are at least a full day older than those of the orcs we have pursued here. The rest of the heroes agreed that he was right, but this discovery did little to ease their mood since it suggested the attack near Bree was only part of a larger plot. There was a brief silence as each member of the company contemplated what might be. At length, one of them spoke. If the orcs are in league together, then it is likely that ones we hunt will lead us to their meeting place. There we may hope to find those who were captured. Even if we cannot rescue them, we can at least avenge ourselves upon their captors. The rest agreed that this was their only course of action, and they resumed the chase. The orcs trail led them north and east towards the weather hills. As they marched, the sky above them grew dark with clouds driven by a chill wind out of the north. By the time they reached the first rocky slope of the hills, it was unusually cold. The heroes drew their cloaks about them, but it did little to keep out the frosty air. As freezing rain began to fall on the heroes in heavy drops, one of them lifted his eyes skyward and said aloud, This is an ill omen, my friends. The weather turns against us and washes out our trail. I fear there is some new evil at work here that gives aid to our enemies. There was some murmur of agreement among the company before another spoke up. It matters not whence the rain comes or if the trail ends. Our quarry hides somewhere in these hills, and we must find them or forsake their captives and our oath. There was a hushed ring of steel as each of the heroes drew weapons in silent reply. The heroes pulled up their hoods and began to search the hills for signs of the orcs. Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin, and today we're going to start Quest 2 of the Lost Realm Cycle. In this video, we're going to do a quick setup, but then we're also going to walk through the two new decks that I'm going to be using for this playthrough. Now, there have been a couple questions that have come up at the end of our first quest that I just want to clarify here. The first thing is, I, I mentioned that I'm going to be playing with totally different decks, and people asked if you had to do that for each quest within a cycle. You certainly do not, and I actually don't recommend that. I'm only doing this because I'm videoing this, and I want to show you all the different decks. Not all of them. I can't show you all of them, but some of the different decks and the synergies between them, and I think it's kind of fun to show you that. So that's why I'm playing with different decks. You definitely don't have to do that. However, you will find that certain quests, you really need to get certain cards in there to help you. So what I usually would suggest doing is play one quest. After you beat it, move to the next one, use the same deck, get annihilated, and then think about how you could change your deck with maybe a couple cards to make it so you could pass it. That's really what I suggest. The other question was asking about if I, ahead of time, always look at the encounter cards when I'm playing. And I will say normally, no. I don't. I like the, oh my gosh, what is, what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> but once again, when I'm recording, I, I have already played this quest. And I'll, already, I'll always have already played it when I, before I record it, just so I make sure I get certain things right so I don't do something wrong. And then the decks can at least handle it, because who wants to watch me lose on the first turn or the second turn? <laughs> so hopefully we'll at least last a couple turns. We might not win, but we'll at least last a few more rounds. Okay, with that, let's start getting set up. You've pursued the remnants of the Orc War Party east from the borders of Reland and into the wilderness beyond. Their trail climbs out of the lowlands and into the Weather Hills. Our setup rules here are set an Orc Ambush and Amun Thorn aside out of play. Create the Orc deck, which I'll show you what that is, and set it next to the quest deck. Make Exposed Ridge the active location, and add a Hunting the Orcs and one Weathered Hilltop to the staging area. The first thing that we'll do is we'll take Amun Forn and the Orc Ambush and place them off to the side. Unfortunately, they're going to come into play later. <laughs> 
Next, we're going to create the orc deck. Now, how you create that is you look for this symbol on the cards that are in the encounter decks and pull all of those out. There should be a total of eight of them. The ninth one is this orc ambush. Since you put that aside, there should be a total of eight of these. Then you also grab the concealed orc camp card. I have three of them. And you shuffle all of this together to create the orc deck. Next, we're going to make exposed ridge as our active location. And it says here, while exposed, exposed ridge is the active location, it gains forced. At the end of the refresh phase, each player deals one damage to a character he controls. So that's going to happen if I do not explore this sufficiently at the end of the round. In the staging area, we're going to have this objective card, Hunting the Orcs, and Weathered Hilltop. Now, Weathered Hilltop will get plus one threat for each resource token on it. And after a Weather Treachery card is revealed, we'll place a one resource token on here. So it's going to get harder or get more and more threat if we let that sit in the staging area and we draw Weather Treacheries. And there's lots of them in this one. This objective card tells us what our mission is. After an enemy is defeated, place one resource token here. Then, if there are at least X resource tokens here, flip Hunting the Orcs and place each resource token that was on it on Savage Counterattack. X is three more than the number of players. So we're going to have to be able to place five progress on this card, or five resource tokens. And to do that, we'll have to defeat five different enemies. So what we've done now is the remaining three types of encounter cards that we have shuffled together to create our encounter deck. As you pursue the orcs, the weather itself turns against you. Now you must contend with the elements while you hunt the enemy. The first weather treachery card revealed each round gains surge. And don't forget, surge means you have to draw another card from the encounter deck. Gross! This quest card also says forced. After the active location is explored, reveal the top card of the orc deck and resolve its staging as if it were just revealed from the encounter deck. Reveal the top two cards or you're playing with three or more characters. We're only playing with two, so we're fine. And you can see here, there is no amount of progress that we can place here to complete this quest. The only way to complete 1B is by getting the five resource tokens on hunting the orcs. So that's the setup for the encounter deck. Now what I want to do is show you the two decks that we're going to use. And just like I did with the other video, just kind of show you some of the synergies. If you're not interested in that, you just want to jump to me drawing my six cards and getting ready for the round, I'll put uh, a note in the description below that will let you know where to jump to for a, a time spot. Otherwise, hang out here and let's look at these decks. And yes, this is a Gandalf. I also want to preface this and say that Steve has been amazing. Thank you, Steve. I've been so busy with trying to do this house stuff. He actually built both of these decks. So I had an idea for a Gandalf deck. He took it and made it better. <laughs> and then he made a deck that would work with this one, as well as it would be good for this scenario. Because like I said, I'm hoping to at least get close to winning, if not winning, so you guys can see that. So let's talk about these heroes. First of all, there's Gandalf, which by the way, 14 threat. Yeah, <laughs> his ability is amazing. Place, uh, play with the top card of your deck face up. Once per phase, you may play the top card of your deck as if it was in your hand. When playing a card this way, Gandalf is considered to have the printed cost of whatever that card is. So for example, if this card was on the top of my deck, I could play this and I would technically use his, I could use his resource because he will be considered lore. Now, it doesn't matter I was a zero cost card. Let's see if I can find one in this deck. Here we go. I could play Light of Valinor if it was on top of our deck. And I could use his resource because he would be considered to be uh, a spirit hero. So cool. But normally, he's not any type. You can see that. He has no specific uh, icon here, so he's not spirit, lore, tactics, or leadership. He is neutral. Glorfindil here, with his threat value, certainly makes up for Gandalf's 14. <laughs> his ability, though, after Glorfindil exhausts to commit to a quest, raise your threat by one. So you can see, if you use him a ton for questing, and you don't have a way to prevent him to exhaust, he is going to increase your threat. Now over here on the far side, there's Elrond, and his is a total of 13 threat. <laughs> but he has an awesome ability too. You may spend resources from Elrond's resource pool to pay for any type of ally. And he has a response that after characters healed by another card effect, heal one damage on it. So he basically makes healing better. 
So you can see here, our total threat will be 32. Not actually terrible, but that's really having to do with Glorfindel. Let's talk quick about some of the allies in this deck. So one of the most important ones, we're running three of them, is the Imlardis Star Stargazer. Because you can look at the top five cards of your deck and rearrange them. And why that's important is we can get an ally maybe or a card that we want on top of our deck because that's essentially in our hand thanks to Gandalf. And you'll see how that works in the playthrough. It is so helpful. And you can do that every round. It's an action. Sure, we have to exhaust her, but ah, she's only a one shield with one health. We're not really going to use her for attacking or for defending. We're going to use her for her ability. Now, we already know what the Warden of Healing does, but that's great with Elrond because he heals two different characters. Each character then will get two healed, uh, will heal two times. Sweet. And then Bilbo over here helps us gain a pipe card, and we have a wizard pipe, which we'll see in the attachments and why that's so important. We also have a few high-cost allies in this deck, and the reason for that is for an attachment you're going to see shortly for Elrond, which allows us to play the top card of our deck for free. So if we can get these allies to the top of our deck, I mean, look at this, three attack, ranged, three attack, ranged, and being able to draw a card. Three attack with the potential of doing, what, plus five? So it's a total of eight attack with Bjorn. <laughs> awesome. Moving to the attachments, this expert treasure hunter, what you get to do here is after the hero quests successfully, what you can do is you can name a card type and discard the top card of your, hand, of your deck, which, hey, we're going to know what that is thanks to Gandalf. If we name it right, we get to put it in our hand. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, and it costs zero. Why not? We also have the wizard's pipe. We'll have to attach this to Gandalf. We can exhaust this pipe to exchange a card in our hand with the top card of our deck. And that's important because of Elrond's ability. When he has Vilya on his hand, which you'll see shortly. Finally, we have Gandalf's staff. That's just going to allow us to do a draw an additional card, gain an additional resource. Just awesome things that Gandalf can do for us. You want to talk awesome for Gandalf? Try Shadowfax. It can only be attached to Gandalf, but he gains ranged and sentinel. And you can exhaust Shadowfax to ready Gandalf. It's like an unexpected courage that makes him ranged and sentinel. <laughs> Sweet. Light of Valinor is a perfect combo with Glorfindel. He would not have to exhaust to commit to a quest, so we don't have to raise our threat. And then here is the awesome, awesome ring for Elrond. You have to exhaust Elrond and the ring to reveal the top card of your deck, which we're already going to know what it is. You can immediately play or put it into play that revealed card for no cost if able. Yeah, so you know, what we do is we get Bayorn onto the top of our deck, and then we exhaust Elrond and we bring out a 3 attack with 6 health and 3 shield, potentially an 8 attack. Yeah, see? Awesome. And finally, for event cards, we have our Glorfindel Greetings just to help us reduce our threat. We have the Flame of Arnor. Awesome for Gandalf. Put that on him. He can then discard it and actually put it into the victory display pile to add additional attack. And we're going to know what card we have to discard and what cost it is. If it's a high cost, it adds plus four or five to his attack. And then, of course, Unexpected Courage. That is an attachment I just also wanted to show you. We're definitely having that in that deck for Gandalf and for Elrond so we can exhaust him, get him ready, and attack and defend. Yeah. For our second deck, we're going to have a scout deck, and that's going to help us with all the locations in this specific quest. So we have Idrian, Arwen, and Aragorn, but the green version of Aragorn. So Idrian, after a location is explored, we can ready Idrian, which is sweet. So she can quest for two, ready, and then look at her attack. It's three. Not bad. Then we have Arwen here. Arwen has three for her willpower, which is great. But then what we can do is we can discard a card to add one resource to either Aragorn's or another Noldor hero. And guess what? This deck has Elrond. So she can even put a resource on Elrond to help this other deck with resource management. And of course, Aragorn here is awesome. He only has one ability. During a refresh action, reduce your threat to your starting threat level once per game. Our total threat is 11 plus 9 plus 12, so it's also 32. I don't think we plan on this, but we always seem to get around the same threat level. Starting with the allies, we have our Ranger of Cardolan. 
What's sweet about the Ranger of Cardolan is his response. So after you engage an enemy, if you control at least one Dunedain hero, which would be Aragorn, you can just spend one resource and plop him into play as a 2-2-2 two, two, two with three health. Then, though, at the end of the round, if he's still there, he goes to the bottom or shuffled into his deck. But this is great if you engage an enemy, you can then use him to defeat it and then throw it under the bottom the, or shuffle him into your deck. The Northern Trackers over here is fantastic for clearing locations. After the Northern Tracker commits to a quest, place one progress token on each location in the staging area. Sweet! I've got a couple of those in my deck, so that means that hopefully if we can get two of those out there, man, we can just be placing progress on locations that aren't even active and complete them. Sweet. We also have this East Road Ranger, and essentially gets a plus two for willpower while it's committed to a side quest. There are a bunch of side quests here, so if we complete a side quest, he is going to be a three willpower. We have a couple more allies and then one attachment that I wanted to show you. So we have Lorien Guide. After Lorien Guide commits to a quest, we can place one progress token on the active location. Once again, just trying to help us quest through as many of these locations as possible. We also have the Mirkwood Explorer. After Mirkwood Explorer quests successfully, place one progress on it. <laughs> Action. Exhaust Mirkwood Explorer to move all progress from it to a location in play. <laughs> so cool. And then here, this is the Dunedain Pipe. You can imagine who this is for. Uh, exhaust Dunedain Pipe and place a card from your hand on the bottom of your deck to then draw a card. Just helps kind of cycle your deck. The other attachment we have is the Warden of Arnor. It has to be to an a scout hero, so that would be Idarion. Uh, while attached characters committed to a quest, place one progress on the first location revealed by the encounter deck. Once again, helping us get through locations that are in the staging area. We all know this card. I played it wrong last time for the first video. We'll play it right the next time, but that'll work really well with Arwen. And then we have this one. This is such a cool card, the Disciplined, or what is it, Desperate Alliance. Choose a hero you control until the end of the phase. Give control of that hero and all resources to another player. Well, this allows us to use Aragorn's ability twice, once for each player. So yeah, we have that in there. It costs zero. Awesome. Finally, just a couple event cards. We have Elrond's Council. So if you control a unique Noldor character, give another character plus one willpower and reduce your threat by three. We have three of those in our deck. <laughs> a test of will, It's always you always want to have some of those when you're using a spirit deck. And then finally, Expert Tracker. After you engage an enemy, exhaust a scout or ranger character to place X progress tokens on a location. X is the engaged enemy's printed threat. So now that we've finished talking about our decks, let's draw our six cards. We're going to start with the Gandalf deck. I'm going to have that be the first player deck. So we've got, okay, Glorfindel's Greeting, Shadowfax, heck yes. One, two, three, Gandalf's Staff. We've got an Imlardus Stargazer. We have Flame of Arnor, and we have Vilya. Okay, not even a question. I have Vilya, and I have Shadowfax. I am set with this beginning hand. We also get to reveal the top card. Oh, it's another Vilya. Okay, that's fine. But still, that is awesome. Now for our scout deck. So we have, ooh, well warded. We have an Elvish Light, I love that card. Oh yes, the Mirkwood Explorer, Northern Tracker. We have another well warded, and we have Elrond's Council. Although this hand is not bad, I think I'm gonna mulligan it. I, I want a couple more good cards in here. Not that there's bad ones, but I just think it's worth trying again. Here we go, this is take two. So we have, ooh, Scouting Party, that's a good one. Elrond's Greeting, we've got the Expert Tracker. Oh, Desperate Alliance, one, two, three, four, two more. We have the Dunedain Pipe, perfect. And we have the Ranger of Cardolan. Okay, I'm, I'm set with that. It's not as, I actually think my first hand was better, but this, this will still be good. That should be it for setup. I say let's go and catch those orcs. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you at the next stop.